Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We come to God, we come to worship Him. Worship is about what we give. When we offer music to God, we are bringing our voices to praise Him. When we offer prayers to God, we are bringing our thankful heart with gratitude and humility, offering it to Him. When we listen to messages and hear His words, we are offering to God our thoughts, our mind, and also our hearts, ready and willing to be transformed for Him. This morning, as we allow and sing along with the praise team, let us be reminded who our God is. There is a God who created all these things. He is worthy of our worship, honor, and glory. Let's come and praise Him. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you, for you are our Creator, the one who deserves honor and praise for all these things that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sin. We thank you, Lord, for the promise that you will continue to do and give to your children what you have planned. And Father, we know that the greatest promise comes in the promise that you will be with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You have given us your spirit. You have given us your word. And help us, Lord, to face through so many difficulties that we may face in life, knowing that as we face them, we know your grace will continue to sustain us. And as you bless us with your grace, enable us, O Lord, to glorify your name. May we truly be faithful disciples who call on our Lord in times of trials and difficulties where we pray and ask God that you would be glorified, Lord, in our lives. 
facing all these tribulations, when there are sickness around us, when there are troubles around us, Lord, show us your faithfulness and help us to show your faithfulness to others. And allow your servant, Lord, this morning to speak about your truth and only your truth, Lord, so that what I say, Father, will be in accordance to your will. We commit this in prayer as we ask this, Lord, in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're continuing on our series, Discipling the Nations, Finishing the Mission. God has given us a command to make disciples. And in His Word, He has reminded us the call to make a disciple. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20 says, Teaching them to obey all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you till the end of the age. Now, a disciple is a learner. He learns and continues to learn from the Master. We, as disciples, we continue learning about our God. We continue to grow in our faith and in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, how did Paul imitate Christ? He know about God. He tried to understand who God is. What was revealed to him after Paul became a Christian? He studied the scripture again, and he spent years trying to understand and relate the scripture, who God is. And then what he knew about God, he began to teach about him. And then Paul did not only teach, but he also followed. He followed Christ. He followed Christ's life, just like he says, imitate me as I am imitating Christ. And then he didn't stop there. He modeled. He modeled how he followed Christ. So he knew about God. He thought about God. He followed God. He modeled about God in his life. So we could see there are two major principles in how Jesus discipled. And this is how we as disciples to become disciples, how we can pass on or how we can disciple others. Number one, Jesus teaches the word of the Father. Jesus modeled a life of obedience. Let's begin with this one. Jesus teaches the word of the Father. You see, when Jesus came to this world, he testified to them that what he taught are the things that the Father has commanded him to say. He said in John 7, 16, he answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. And if anyone is willing to do his will, anyone who knows the Father, who understands, who searches the scriptures that reveals about the Father, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. Is Jesus teaching something new? or what he is teaching is from the Father. See? And he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. So we know that everything that Jesus revealed, everything that he taught the people, the Beatitudes, the teachings about the parables, these are truth revealing about the Father. And Jesus also modeled a life of obedience. We saw the obedience of Christ. He says in John 6, 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, this is very important because we are given a choice here to follow the will of God or to follow our own will. So Jesus set the example. He modeled that. He repeated that in his ministry and in his life. Luke 22, 42, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was praying, he said, Lord, remove this cup from me. This is my will. I want this cup to be removed. We just celebrated the Resurrection Sunday. Can you imagine if Christ will one over the Father's will at that time. 
There would not have been any cross. There would not have been any resurrection. But this was the culminating point of Jesus modeling life of obedience. This is what he said. Not my will, but your will be done. We disciple by modeling an example of obedience. We teach the word. As Jesus teach the word, we model the life of obedience as Jesus modeled the life of obedience. So from these two main principles, this is now how we apply the truth in our life today. How do we teach? How do we disciple, especially new believers? We disciple them in the word and we disciple them in the life of obedience. The same two principles that Jesus had applied to himself. What does disciple in the word means? It is simply teaching the word. You see, discipleship is about passing down the truth to them. Now, this is very important. When you think of discipleship, think about the sets of truth that we need to pass down to people. That is God's command. So, what do we teach them? Number one, the whole counsel of the Bible. Number two, we teach them by entrusting the precious truth and by guarding the truth. The whole counsel of the Bible. The whole counsel means the whole will of God found in the scripture. You see, we are not to be selective of what we teach. We don't only teach those things that we feel we are very comfortable of. We teach the whole counsel because we want believers to be strengthened in their faith. That's why the whole counsel includes the whole plan of God, the whole teachings of the scripture. As Paul said in Acts 20:26, 20, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole will of God. Before Paul left the Ephesians elders, he gave them this statement. He said, you know that you can say, I have done my part. I have explained to you everything that you need to know. That's why if you or anyone would fall away, I am innocent of that person's blood. Because I have taught you the whole counsel of the word of God. And this is also important because as disciples, as people who teach the word, who pass down the truth, Paul said to Timothy, Paul was the discipler, Timothy was his disciple. Present yourself approved to God. This is important. As someone who disciple another person, you need to remember your approval comes from God. How does God approve us who will not be ashamed who accurately handle the word of truth? Brothers and sisters, we are called to know the truth. You cannot teach something that you do not know. And we need to know them the whole counsel of them so that we can teach them. The second thing is entrusting the precious truth or we safe deposit of the truth. Here it says in 2 Timothy, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Paul is telling Timothy this, entrust them to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. You see, Paul didn't say, okay, Timothy, I have done my part. It's okay now that you know. Good. No, the instruction there was make sure that you entrust them to those faithful people who will be able to teach others also. The word entrust in Greek is paratetimai, to make a safe deposit. It carries the idea of depositing the precious truth for the purpose of being able to pass it down to others. You see, Paul makes sure that what he is teaching Timothy is not just the truth, 
but he is teaching Timothy how he can be sure that this truth is passed on to others. See that? It's like making a safe deposit. The key is to be able to pass it down. You have a systematic teaching that, that produces like a safe deposit that you can pass down to others. And making sure that as you pass down, the others will be able to pass it down as well. That's the idea. Third, guard the truth. The truth needs to be protected against those that will always pervert the word. Now, this is very, very important, brothers and sisters. We do not only teach them truth. We teach them how to be able to pass down the truth. And we teach them how they can guard the truth. Guarding the truth means being able to clearly, masterfully understand what we believe in. You know why? Because the truth will always be perverted. The Word of God will always be and has always been under attack. Jesus warns of false prophets in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophet which comes to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Paul warns of false teachers. In the same chapter, he says, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Peter warns of false teachers that are in their midst. But false prophets arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Now, we, we could say, we could identify, yes, there are, there are different heresies, there are different cults of Christianity uh, that has arisen throughout the years, and we are able to identify them. But here is a very clear warning from John, which he says, These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. You see, brothers, these are not people outside of the church. John was identifying those people inside a church who are trying to deceive them teaching them false doctrines. Jude urged the believers to fight against false teachers inside the church. This is what he said, Beloved, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend, you fight earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Jude was writing to a church that has already been infested with false teachings. That's why it is so precious that we know the truth, so to be able to guard them. We cannot just say simply, doesn't matter what the truth is, or the truth is relative, depends on how you interpret it. No, brothers and sisters, we need to know what the truth of the word is, so that we can defend it. We can guard against it because that guard against the false teachings because that is the warning given to us. So that's why 1 Timothy 1.19, Paul says, Keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, they have rejected keeping the faith and therefore failing in their conscience. You see, if you do not have a basis of truth, what is affected is your conscience. You don't know how to teach your conscience. And what happens then? You suffered shipwreck in your faith. You fall away. And that's what we call apostasy. Now, we are not just simply to teach the truth. That's just half. Jesus also said to obey. So, we disciple them in the life of obedience. Second principle. 
Now, this is very important, brothers and sisters. See, the life of obedience is often associated with the life of faith. Meaning, when we say a life of faith, a person who puts their faith in God produces obedience. Okay? How do you measure the faith? You measure the fruit of obedience in your life. Because a genuine faith is always accompanied by fruits of obedience. So how do you know a person has faith? You know it if a person produces fruits of obedience. James says faith without work or fruit is dead. A faith that does not produce any work is called a dead faith. So He differentiated between a true living faith that will produce fruit, obedience, versus a person who claims that he has a faith, but there is no evidence to fit. You see, anybody can say, I have faith. Anybody can say, I accept. Anybody can say, I believe. So how do you determine? How would you know? If this person's faith is genuine, should we know? Pastor, if we try to ask that question, wouldn't wouldn't we be judging them? Are we not then showing love because we are judging them? We're asking them fruits or evidence? No, brothers and sisters. In fact, this is very crucial in order for you to determine what is true. This is starting for yourself. You need to examine if you are truly in the faith. And what you know to be true for yourself, we can also teach others. Okay? A faith that produces work, he calls it a living faith. Jesus calls these works as fruit. So what do we need to see when we talk about a life of obedience? What do we want to do? What do we want to teach them? Here it is. A life of faith is a life examined. Let me repeat that. A life of faith is a life examined. So to disciple them in the life of obedience means to examine, to check whether they are in the faith. You can't just be satisfied and and feel complacent and say, I have faith and that's it. No. Because there can be a false faith, and that leads to false security. And this is what James has been warning us. And the scripture has also been warning us about that. And Jesus himself identified by saying, the good tree will always produce good fruit. So that's how you determine, you examine. So going here, he says, what should we examine? What do we need to see? Three things. Examine the fruit of the Spirit. Examine the fruit of godliness. And examine the fruit of righteousness. Examine the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Now when Paul says acts of the flesh, these are people who follow their flesh, who walk according to their own flesh, to their own lusts. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Then he says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those Christians or those who profess to call themselves Christians and continued in this kind of life. See, Paul is saying, if this person says he is a believer, okay, he's a believer, and then he continues with these sets of life, I'm telling you, Paul saying, be careful because those who live such kind of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he continued, in 522 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace forbearance kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control 
against such things, there is no law. Okay, I want you to take note of this because we are examining, right? So what do we need to examine here? First, we need to know what it means to walk in the Spirit. See, the Spirit will produce the fruits in our lives. That's the work of the Spirit. Okay, it didn't say, listen, it didn't say we will produce the fruit or that we should try to produce it. No, Paul is very clear. That's the Spirit's job. That's the Spirit who's going to do that. So we need to examine if the disciple is producing that fruit. If the Spirit is producing the fruit in the disciple's life. Okay? The Spirit produces fruit in our lives when we obey. Okay? So Paul is saying, you walk in the Spirit. You obey. That's why the question should be is, are we obeying God? Before we before we ask why is the why is the fruit of the spirit of the love the joy patience is not produced in your life the very first question you should be asking is are you obeying god right because obedience is about walking it's about abiding in the spirit it is being filled with the spirit now i want to i want to go back with you on this verse now, this is very important, and I want you to see this from John chapter 15, verse 4. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. This is what he said. Remain in me, and I in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. Look at this. This is Christ. He is the branch, and the believers are the branches. You see that? Now, Jesus is saying is that we, as the branches, we need to be connected to Christ. You see that? So that when we are connected to Christ, Christ, through His Spirit, will now produce the fruit in us. You see that? We, brothers and sisters, we are never commanded to produce the fruit. Now, check the word again. It says here, we are simply commanded to remain. Remaining is abiding. Remaining is being connected. So, if you're saying that there is no fruit of love, there is no fruit of joy, question is, are we connected? Right? Because being joined to Christ, being connected to Christ, causes us to produce the fruit. So, for example, the Lord commands us to forgive. That's a commandment. So, if we don't forgive, we sin. If there are sins, then we are no longer abiding in Christ. We are no longer connected. If we are no longer abiding, then God cannot produce the fruit of love in God in our lives. Do you see that? You have to understand, brothers and sisters, that the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control is a supernatural fruit, and only the Holy Spirit can produce this in your life. So, to ask the question, are these fruits produced in your life? If there is the absence of this fruit in your life, we need to examine them. Are we living in obedience or in disobedience? So the question you need to be asking then is to examine. Are we in obedience? As Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my command. Are we confessing our sins? If we have sins but you do not recognize them as sins, you do not confess them, of course, as sins. As Jesus said, we need to confess our sins. Are you resisting the devil? This is a command. We should resist the devil. Draw near to God. Are you making provisions in the flesh? Paul said we need to put on Christ. We need to make effort to put on Christ in your life. If you're not doing that, then you're making provisions for the flesh. 
Or are you quenching the spirits? Is the spirit calling you to do this? Is the spirit calling you to give up on this? But you won't do that. Then you're living in disobedience. What's happening is that you are not abiding. So you are like this branch cutting yourself away from Christ. So therefore, you cannot produce the fruit. You need to be connected back. You need to be grafted back in, abiding, walking, being filled with the Spirit. Second thing that we need to examine is examine the fruit of godliness. Godliness is a proper response to the things of God, which produces obedience through holy living. You see that? It is the response. The knowledge of God causes us what? As Paul said, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. As a sacrifice, we are set apart. Our life is a sex set apart. We are offered as a worship to God. That's a holy living. It is making a choice that has to do with keeping yourself from sin. Okay? Making efforts to develop discipline to make your life more holy and obedient to God. And it begins with a heart after God. This is what sets David apart. The Bible said he is a man after God's own heart. His desire, the works that David do for the Lord begins from his heart. Okay? We need to examine if there is an ongoing intentional desire to pursue holiness of God. So as a disciple, you want to ask your disciple then, or a new believer, are you producing or do you have this desire for the Lord to be holy, to live in conformity for Him? Do you see sin as something offensive towards God and you want to get rid of that because you want to please God so this is it begins with the heart David says create in me a clean heart O God and renew a right spirit within me this is a prayer that doesn't happen only on Sunday we often measure Christianity only on a Sunday but needs to come within from Mondays to Saturdays, the whole 24-7. Is there that desire to pursue God every day? 1 Timothy 1.5, Paul says, The goal of our instructions is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It's very important that Timothy begins with a right heart. To check if there is sin because if there is sin his conscience would tell him a good conscience means he's living a right in a right relation with the Lord second we need to build disciplines that promotes godliness we need to examine if there are spiritual disciplines that helps develop the pursuit of holiness. What do we talk about spiritual disciplines? These are things that we add to our everyday life from Mondays to Saturdays. What we do to have a more quiet time with God, a more prayer time with God, a more ways to be filled with the Spirit of God in everything we do. We try to learn how to integrate God's thoughts throughout the day so that, as David says, we meditate on the Word of God day and night. As Paul said, praying without ceasing. How do you do that? It's not that you close your eyes throughout the day, every day. No. It's how you integrate that. How you design your life to revolve around Putting God in every part of your life, whether you are out in the market or in the work or at home preparing dishes, food, or with your children. How can you integrate those things? What discipline can you do to improve? See, there is that desire. There's no, there's no contentment and say, I'm already okay. Because once you said, I'm already okay, there's no more need for that. 
then you stop growing. You stop developing that desire. But what we should do is we need to pursue more. So have that right heart and followed by discipline. 1 Timothy 4.7 says here, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. You see that? Paul says, Find ways, Timothy, to get yourself disciplined for godliness. And then he compared that with what? For bodily discipline. People were so engaged with different kinds of discipline, exercise, diet. And here Paul is comparing that. He's, this is what he's saying. Is only of little profit but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come now he's not saying that bodily disciplines are not important but if we are putting emphasis on bodily discipline how much more should we put emphasis on spiritual discipline okay so examining godliness results to obedience to Christ, preserving against sins and temptation. So examine if there are more and more sins in your life or it should be less and less sins in your life. Third, examine the fruit of righteousness. Righteousness means a right relationship with God. Fruit of righteousness are work okay, that shows you have a right relationship with God. Matthew 5.16 says, Thus let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good works. They should glorify your Father in the heavens. Now, what kind of good works? What kind of work righteousness are we talking about? First, it's actually the fruit of perseverance. You see, Matthew was talking about when Jesus was talking about let your light shine in the previous verses the context says blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness blessed are the meek blessed are the pure in heart blessed are the peacemakers see as Christians when we are faced with trials and difficulty we profess our testimony of faith that brothers and sisters is shining your light that you are being the salt in this world and one good example of that is Job he said naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away blessed be the name of the Lord Job his business his property, even his precious family was taken away from him. His health was also taken away from him. He came this close to dying. And yet, he has this to say. He has this to confess. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the fruit of righteousness. When you are persecuted, how do you respond to that? When you are facing trials, do you glorify God? We are called to be the salt and the light. That is our opportunity to glorify God. What is happening to you is not uncommon. It happens to everyone, but this is why as believers we are put in a microscope how do you respond now that you are a believer i want to praise god i want to grab this opportunity to glorify god the testing of our precious faith is the key and what the fruit of perseverance is this is what peter said this, and he's referring to problems, trials, difficulties, sickness. This is what he says. This have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, 
may result in the praise and in the glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you have this faith that is more precious than gold? It needs to be tested to see if it is genuine, to see if it is true, so that it will bring glory to God when you profess and give thanks to God. Lastly, the, fa- the fruit of faithful service. Fruit of righteousness is a faithful worker who is committed to the kingdom's work and is not ashamed to be examined by the coming Lord. See, we are all slaves with a master who has commanded us to do his work. We need to always remember that we serve a master. You need to have that in mind that we are grateful that our master has purchased us, has bought us. That's the concept that Paul wanted to teach us. And because of that, any goodness that our master shows to us is something we are grateful. You see? If we see God as a master and see ourselves as slaves, it produces in us, it compels us to understand that we live in awe and fear of Him. So that any manifestations of God's goodness, He will call us friend. He will give His life for us. He will make us heirs of His glory is something that will trigger tantamount of joy in us because we don't deserve that. We don't deserve that and yet our Master is so kind to us. Paul lived his life in such a way and Paul is an example of a person who you examine his life has this fruit of faithful service. This is what he has to say. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also on all who have loved his appearing. Now I was wondering every time I read through this passage why did Paul say the crown of righteousness is what awaits him. Why not the imperishable crown? Why not the crown of rejoicing? Why not the crown of life? Why the crown of righteousness? You know why, brothers and sisters? This crown of righteousness is because Paul has fought for the truth of the gospel. He was wrongfully accused, questioned about his motive, looked down because of his teachings. He was persecuted by both believers and non-believers. He was put in prison and sentenced to death. A lot of people were questioning Is he truly an apostle of God? Was he really called by God? Paul is suffering in his life. Probably he has done something wrong. Just like Job, his friends, was accusing him. But Paul sees it differently. He sees that all of these are challenges against an obstacle that he needs to overcome. Yet, Paul continued faithfully in serving God. And in the end, on the day of judgment, God will vindicate me. See, the crown of righteousness is Christ's righteousness imputed to us. Paul is going to receive this crown of righteousness saying that through all your accusations against me, Christ considered me righteous and has worked 
in me and produce all this fruit in my life. That's why, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, everything can be summed up in these two words, teach and obey. Just like what Paul reminded Timothy. He says, pay close attention to yourself. See if you are obeying. See if you're maintaining a pure conscience and to your teachings. Preserve in the teachings, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and after and also for those who hear you. Here is how you know if you are in the faith. This is how you pass down the truth, the principle you teach and you model obedience in your life. In conclusion, let's review. The two main principles that we learn from our Lord is that we disciple them in the Word, we teach them the whole counsel of the Bible by entrusting the precious truth and by guarding the truth. We disciple them in the life of faith. A life of faith is a life of obedience, is a life examined. Examine the fruit of the Spirit, examine the fruit of godliness, and examine the fruit of righteousness. In reflection, three important questions. Why is it important to know the whole counsel of the Word and how we can guard the truth? How can I examine the fruit of the Spirit in my life? And what areas in my life do I need to examine as it relates to godliness? Hope that you can use this to reflect throughout the week. We praise the Lord for having this opportunity to worship Him together. For some important announcement, we just want to continue encouraging our listeners to be part of a small group. It is very important that we develop a deeper walk with God and we can learn what it means to be God's disciple. We can be nurtured through His truth and we can achieve and understand what our purpose in life is. We hope that you would contact our pastors so that we can hear from you and help you pursue a life of obedience in the Lord. Secondly, we will have our Joshua and Women's Fellowship this coming April 20. Our speaker again is Reverend Elson Lau and he will be sharing on our discipleship series modeling a life of obedience his topic will be consistent courage in tough times part two this will be available on video in youtube tuesday night at 8 p.m third we have our bong un seniors ministry also available online 
and they will have their Bible studies every Wednesdays at 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. This will be available in Hokkien. If you are interested to join, please connect with Pastor Phoebe for further details. Again, if you have kids, children, ages 4 to 12, I encourage you to have them join our NMEC Kids Worship Online. Please have them register to join the Zoom classes. This will give them a chance to know more about Bible stories, characters, important lessons, and they can discover new lessons every week. So visit our website for that. We also have our youth fellowship called Engage, happening every Saturday at 3 p.m. This is not only for teenagers who are in high school, but also colleges and young professionals. So for further details, I hope you can contact or look for Pastor Danny and Pastor Jaya. We also have our Joyful Hope Counseling Ministry for those of you who are interested or in need of counseling. Please look for Pastor Jean Chan for other details. If you have friends or relatives who prefer to listen in Mandarin, we have Mandarin online services every Sunday at 10 a.m. You can also check all their other activities during the week at our website. And finally, for all our details and upcoming events, please follow us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share our posts to your family and friends. Let us come to the Lord in benediction. To the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who has made available for us His love through the promised Holy Spirit who will be faithful in forming Christ in us because of the plan of the Father who had made all these things possible for us. Be all praise, glory, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.